The Reef Therapy Podcast is powered by ICP Analysis. If you'd like to win a free saltwater ICP analysis kit and a freshwater analysis kit, all you have to do is leave a comment down below using the hashtag what's in your water. If you're listening to the audio only version, head on over to YouTube and you can enter in the comment section there. ICP Analysis will test over 50 elements down to parts per trillion. These tests can also be used to see if there's any undesirable elements in your aquarium as well. Register your aquarium on the ICP Analysis app, fill your sample, place it back into the bag, slap on that included postage, and have your results one to three days after it's received. More at icpanalysis.com. Hey, Reef Builders, and welcome to episode number 87 of the Reef Therapy Podcast, powered by ICP Analysis. More at icpanalysis.com. Today, we'll get an update on where everything is in this busy holiday season, and also chat with our guest tonight. Doc, uh, I almost called you doctor. Uh, Mr. <laughs> David Lemus, lifelong aquarist, uh, formerly of Top Shelf Aquatics. Uh, there's so much, so many different facets to you, and I can't wait to get into it. So, David, before we get into everything in this podcast. Why don't you give us some of your background, how you got into the hobby, your time at Top Shelf, and then what you're up to now. Well, yes, uh, I am formerly from Top Shelf Aquatics, uh, a great amazing guys, a bunch of guys over in Orlando, Florida, had a great time working with them. Um, I've probably four or five years uh, known the owners as far as even prior to Top Shelf Aquatics, so they have been eagerly into the hobby and to reefing well prior to even the opening of Top Shelf, as far as when I first met Kevin, as far as years prior, going into corals and macroalgae and everything, we would, we would talk for hours. So that's how, of how my beginning started, just knowing uh, first the guys over there. Prior to that, I have been in the hobby since 1995. And I started off with a small 10 gallon nano. I understand back in mid 90s, nano tanks were completely as far as out of the realm of even having one and you got a lot of um uh <laughs> flack for it but uh that was my very first tank live rock and i used to use ocean water as uh my water changes and for filling my tanks i spent some little time at whitney laboratories uh, by the university of florida marineland it's a very small research facility and it's all marine biology and all throughout high school i first spent many hours uh, working there and helping out and basically my main job was taking care of clownfish at the time and collecting eggs. It was fantastic. And since then, I have been keeping salt water from mangroves to reef to corals to you name it. I've been into it. So I enjoy every aspect of the hobby. So, yeah, Top Shelf Aquatics is, I think, where where I kind of ran across. Maybe, maybe it was just before that. I remember... Uh, you and, uh, Stephanie had kind of, I think you were on a, you were on a live stream or something. You're like, Bahama Lava Corals here, Bahama Lava Coral, you, you're doing awesome stuff. You're doing, you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we got to talking, I think it was like Aquashella Dallas, I believe. Oh, and I just yeah. remember you and, uh, and it, maybe Jake, were you talking to Jake at that one? I know he was there. Um, and, uh, another guy from the Solomon Island stuff, what was yes. his name? Tim? That was, that was Aquashella, uh, Orlando. Orlando. And yes. what it was is that I was talking to Jake and I was also speaking with, uh, Tim Kelly. He's Tim the one Kelly, actually, yes. he's doing the uh, Solomon Islands. He, so he manages, as far as I remember, he manages all the, of course, corals and hopefully clownfish <laughs> that come again because Solomon Island clowns are by far the best. But, um, yeah. As far as that was the that was the first time as far as you and I had spoken of prior to that, I think. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, uh, one of my favorite things right now is I'm kind of like I don't, I don't I wouldn't say I'm a rookie, but I'm just a little bit beyond that, maybe intermediate at this point into getting Absolutely. into the advanced stuff. But I love listening to advanced reefers talk, and so we were at Aquashella Daytona. Uh, last week or a couple weeks ago and just listening to Chris Meckley and Julian Sprung talk back and forth and me just kind mm -hmm. of being a third party to that situation. I love it so much. Um, so we, yeah, we kind of met at, uh, an, in Orlando and, uh, I don't know. I just, I felt like you're this guy who knows so much about corals and we finally now get an opportunity to kind of explore all that. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, the podcast. What are you working with right now? What do you, what kind of tanks are you, uh, are you around in your, in your house right now? Well, at the, or currently at the moment I have three, well, 
technically four. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to lose count. Uh, <laughs> three of the two twenty. As, as the we do, as we do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I have the 220. Uh, that is just Stephanie's tank. Of course, you've probably seen it in of course, multiple YouTube videos, Instagram of Queen of Reef. But um, I have my 60 gallon, of course, I do work on. Of course, that is my little personal tank right behind my desk for work. So even when my day gets overly long and I'm sitting there hours on end, I can kind of just take a peek behind me and my tank's right there. I also have, of course, a just a little quarantine setup. We have the one of the PNW's micro tank. That one is in the kitchen. It just offsets the uh, <laughs> the cutlery. And then, of course, in the backyard, I have a mangrove saltwater pond, which uh, does pose some issues, especially when it starts to snow and get into the 30s over here in uh, Texas. Yeah. Uh, anything you're going through right now? Any issues that uh, you want to vent about? Uh, lack of time. <laughs> feel that that's uh <laughs> i would love to work on my tank more than i would like than i would like to admit but um at first at the time at the moment right now i need to sit down i need to get out in the garage i have a hole set up i have the rock set up and i need to make a brand new aquascape for my tank because right now i'm rocking the all just basically frag wrecks and basically just a small ones magnetic ones the entire tank is stacked as far as like pancakes of just frag wrecks and just all the corals and wrecks and the corals keep growing onto the frag wrecks. So all that extra growth I have to scrape off and toss out because, or kind of stick it to a little tiny little frag plug. But, uh, yeah, yeah. aqua skipping is my next big thing. Tell me about the, uh, tell me about the pond, the pond. Well, currently the pond is a Rubbermaid, Rubbermaid tote. It's 150 okay. gallons. It was never intended to be that. I actually used a koi pond when I was in Florida. And in my backyard, since it was Florida weather, humidity is great, plenty of sunshine. So it was fantastic. I could put, I had zero filtration, which my coworkers at Top Shelf, a couple of the online guys always laugh because all I had in there was quite frankly, an MJ 1200. Now, if you're an old school reefer, you know about those pumps. They last forever. And this particular one I had in my garage that was going on, wow, 16 years old. And that wow. little pump, just put it on the side and made a little bit of flow. And that was it. So as my, uh, my love for experimenting, I took a Rasta hammer and a Hilda grill torch and just put it in the mangrove pond right in the center, just for fun to see what would happen. Because I do have uh, several colonies of Holy Grail and several colonies of the Rasta. So I decided, what's one head? Put it out there, never really thought very much. And all of a sudden it started growing. So between that, I would have some scarlet hermits i also have a few turbos in there uh well yeah a couple mexican turbos just to get some of the extra algae but i am currently in the midst of repotting all three mangroves because they've expanded way larger than their current nursery pot that i have them floating in but as of right now i do have <laughs> two <laughs> 300 watt heaters in there right at the currently at the moment so that's keeping all of the temperature down and i've made a makeshift plastic roof which collects the condensation, collects a little bit of the heat, and all the heat, even at 30 degrees outside, the mangroves are staying nice and toasty at between 72 and 74. So I have no wow. complaints. I'm going to insulate it hopefully over the next few weeks, the very bottom, to kind of key in that those degrees, and then maybe I'll throw a couple of damsels in there and see what happens. One of my one of my all time uh, goals in this hobby is to have a legit pond set up doesn't have oh, to necessarily yeah. be outside but just just a you know it looks like a koi pond it feels like a koi pond but there's coral inside you know what i mean um, oh yeah so with your i i guess a, a question that i would have right off the bat with keeping coral in one of those kinds of ponds is what's the par what's the i mean are we are we talking if we're going to get overheated uh is it is it not deep enough do you know? Uh, you're probably going to think I'm a little crazy. I'm one of those few people who I, I have not measured the part of my tank. And I guess it becomes that old school reefer mentality where I'm looking at the corals. I'm looking at the polyps. I'm looking at the extension. I'm even looking at the thickness of the tissue, whether it be an acro or a chalice. How far is it protruding from the skeleton? How far is, is it fluffy? Is it overly fluffy where it's like swelling up? And those kind of cues kind of give me whether my corals need more light or less light. I guess it's a, yeah, it's that old school metal halide uh, T5 mentality from way back when, you know, I can go further back to the power compacts of the late nineties. 
So have you uh, have you fully accepted LEDs yet into your life, or are you still holding out? It it took me a little while. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I did add a series of metal halide that I just did not want to give up. Uh, but when Top Shelf first opened up, as far as I let Kevin use a few of my as far as metal highlights, actually all of them at the time, <laughs> to help him as far as light up his uh, first farm. So I was more than happy to uh, donate him at the time to help out. Well, borrow. And uh, But yeah, I've fully adopted. I have XR30s above my tank. And as crazy as it sounds, I have an XR30 Radeon for my refugium because uh, the macro algae needs some light. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give a quick update on the Red Sea that I just got not too long ago. I say not too long ago. It's been, I guess I, I received it maybe in June, and now we're in November, and I finally got fish and coral in it. So uh, right. it's very exciting. Um, actually, the first coral that was received was from Top Shelf Aquatic, so um, shout very out nice. to, to them for sending me some stuff. Uh, but I added all of the fish from the tub, from my former frag tank, which I was very nervous about. I think if if you've had fish for any length of time, five plus years, and you're adding them to a new environment, you get that little bit of like, please survive. Mm-hmm. I love you too yeah. much. Please don't die. Uh, thankfully, oh, yeah. everybody's doing great. Um, it was a Tamini Tang to um, my spawning pair of clownfish. And what was the other one? Oh, and Molly, Molly Miller Blenny that I returned to the LFS <laughs> <laughs> nice. because the first fish that I put in there was a Midas Blenny and yeah. I didn't oh. know if there would be Blenny on Blenny crimes going on and there no offense be. to the Molly Miller. I, <laughs> I kind of like the Midas's colors a little bit better and he already has an awesome personality. So, um, and then I let my, my kids pick out a fish cause this is like the first big tank that they've had that they get to come down and look at. My son picked a chromus, <laughs> blue green chromus. Wrong with that chromus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my daughter wants a purple tank. So there's a little oh. bit of a disparity in price there. Yeah. <laughs> and those purple but, tanks uh, could be, you could be mean. Yeah, yeah. So the one that the one that I've kind of got my eye on right now just came into the local fish store that I go to, Corner Reef, all the time, and it's uh, it's it's small. I mean, it's pretty small, so uh, hopefully they'll kind of all grow up together and there won't be a, any aggression, but uh, yeah. also have a uh, golden assessor basslet on Ooh, order that's coming nice. in as well. Oh, so that'll be nice. A buddy, a buddy of mine, Tyler, you, have you met Tyler? Tyler Wells Inland underscore Reef? He's got the mangrove tanks here in St. I've Louis. actually, I messaged him on Instagram once when he first set yeah. it up and he put driftwood in his tank. Yes. And everybody was giving him flack left and right about putting driftwood. Yes. So I felt bad when I saw that and I messaged him. That was the only time I, I think I've talked to him. And I said, hey, listen, I've already tried putting as far as uh, driftwood in there. And mm-hmm. I got driftwood from the Florida for us from the coastline yeah. that I had for years. And I put it in the water. I said, as long as you keep your alkalinity in salt water, very alkaline water, it won't deteriorate like it will in fresh water. So you can start mounting course. And I sent him a photo of a, of a dendro that I glued to the side of the driftwood. Yeah. And I said, don't worry about it. Try it. You should have fun. But I haven't met him in person. I think he ended up with a nephthia on the side, like growing off the side of one really? of the pieces of wood. Yeah. Oh, super nice. cool. Uh, and he, I think he's still got that all set up. He's rearranged it a couple of times. But yeah, I, I love uh, I love going over to his place because he's always experimenting with, you know, some, some weird stuff or some, mm-hmm. you know, the stuff that you don't normally see in the hobby. He's got a black uh, lava rock tank with a lobster in it, you know, kind of s- some different, some different looks. Cause we're also, we're also used to seeing the, the purple rocks and things like that. But when you see it, when you see it from like a freshwater scaper point of view, mm-hmm. it just has a totally different look to it. So um, I don't know where I was going with that story. Uh, <laughs> let's see. How did he, Oh, I we're have, going out to, uh, to local fish store Saturday. So right. at the time of this recording, it's before black Friday, it's just before Thanksgiving. And, uh, Jake always did this where he would go out to all the local fish stores in the Denver area and a little mm. bit beyond that and just give them business on local fish store Saturday. So nice. Tyler and I have made a pact and we're going to go out to, we have, I think seven or eight local fish stores here in town. Uh, so oh, we're wow. pretty lucky. 
uh, with that. Cause I know that if you live in a smaller town, you're not going to have that many local fish stores. So, oh, yeah. um, we're going to go to each one of those and I've already got a couple things I've got my eyes on for that weekend. So the golden assessor basslet is one of them. And then the purple tang is another, and we'll see what kind of corals these guys, uh, oh, yeah. these guys come up with. So, um, but yeah, excited for that corals that came in. Um, let's see, let me look here. Manila spy got a grafted, um, digitata the uh, what's the bird's nest called uh it's got a weird name to it but the um, Panape bird's nest or yes 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 that one yeah that one okay uh satosa uh, the uh grafted one the dual colored grafted satosa uh i've oh, got nice. a flame of uh, jason fox fox flame just a regular green tenuous in here the uh hydnophora that they've got at top shelf that gamma knife one mm -hmm. um and a couple other bits and pieces here i've got a piece of the um uh crystal experiment jake adams crystal experiment in here which i know is you know it's it's like a ten dollar frag right but yeah it I sounds familiar like i can't think of yeah and hmm. we were actually so reef builders was selling some frags at aqua shell daytona and i picked up the uh -huh. hardline hoaxamai and I think the other one that oh. I got was the Immortal Tort. So, so, you, so they're you both in the tank. Hokey. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping that everything does well. I've been monitoring all the parameters like crazy because this is probably the most like SPS that I've had this early on in a tank. So yeah. uh, the reef mat has been doing a great job at removing the nitrates that I've <laughs> been putting into it. So I'm dosing nitrates to keep them up. I'm trying to keep them up around between five and 10 right now yeah. um, just to have some nutrients in the tank. And I'm hoping with the addition of some more fish that I have, you know, a little bit more of that organic nutrient into the water. Mm -hmm. But any tips, any tips from you on this, on this new tank adventure as far as parameters uh, go and SPS? Well, I do have to applaud your use of, uh, and I'm with, I'm with the reef bum on this one. Uh, live rock, live sand. As far as yes. I am, never set up a tank except while I was at top shelf at a few tanks over there where they use the bottle bacteria myself personally in all my tanks I have been a live rock uh, live sand type person and that's actually how I start up all my cryptic refugiums is with live rock so I get it flown in I and mean, I always ask the seller depending on where I get it from package it in water because when I want it to arrive I want as much life as possible and I understand mm -hmm. everybody's worried about pests and a lot of times people always ask, well, what about uh, Aptasia? What about, um, as far as, uh, you know, hydroids? What about flatworms, planaria? Everything you could possibly think of. Mantis shrimps. And <laughs> mantis shrimps, <laughs> urchins, yeah. uh, sea stars. Oh, and I have had two mantis shrimps the last time I did it. Two little green ones popped out of the rock. But what I do is I quarantine it. I put it in a separate tank for a few weeks and I quarantine it and I watch it and observe it. And I check for every little pest. For instance, uh, like an old school trick, which I haven't heard anybody mention in probably about two decades, is when you, you have live rock and you're trying to quarantine it, if you have little bugs, fireworms, or you're trying to get it out of a little hole, one old school trick we used to do is you take some salsa water. And you just take a little eyedropper, you squirt it in that little hole where you think something's at. So you saw something that just kind of moved around weird, put it in, and the bubbles in the, as far as from the CO2, and all of a sudden you'll see a bristle worm or whatever is in that little hole just kind of sprout right out. I've had yeah. a mantis shrimp jump into my hand, and I caught it, and I just put him in a little cup, <laughs> kept him <laughs> in his own little tank. But, uh, oh, yeah, as far as that's, that's one of my biggest things. I think the bacteria load on live rock is phenomenal. So... Uh, that's the way I've always set some my tanks up overall. So the fact that you did that with Tampa Bay, yeah, absolutely really good. Yeah, I and and I actually thought I was going to get a lot more crap for just tubbing the sump and the or tubbing the sand and the sump just so I could get the beneficial all the hey. beneficial bacteria and things like that because I wanted to keep it bare bottom, you know, partially because I think that's what Jake would do, and this is kind of like a little bit of a tribute tank to him, um, but also I I just. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, to have all that beneficial stuff. And it was fun to watch all the little critters, even in sand, pop out. I mean, I've still got a crab that has yet to be identified. Um, and I've even, I've sent it, I've talked about this numerous times in this podcast. I've sent it to <laughs> multiple crustacean people. And they, I think until it gets a little bit bigger, until it gets some more identifiable traits, because it looks like a lot of things right now. Um, 
a lot of people have said maybe it's a pom pom crab, but I don't think I don't uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think pom pom crabs are Caribbean. I could They're be not. wrong on that. Yeah. Um, send send me the photo. I'll find out what it is. Give me like three days, and I'll have a, I'll have a name, and I'll have a scientific name for you. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, this is this is something I love doing. If you can find an odd creature that you don't know what it is, at first, even at Aquashello Daytona, at vibrant corals, they're trying to figure out a coral, and I was sitting there counting individual as far as spicules on the coralite, just so I knew what what species it was. At first, it was Cyphastria, it wasn't Cyphastria, and then we kept moving down the line. But yeah, as far as let me see it, I, I'm I'm I love a challenge. Yeah, I will. I will definitely send you that. But man, uh, I was watching the latest BRS stuff. You know, they've got the fifty-two SE or whatever you know thing they're doing these days. But all the all the tanks that they're doing have the Tampa Bay live sand in them. And mm-hmm. Ryan went on this whole big thing about how they've you know tried dry rock and the micro you know trying to get the microbiome up before the you know adding any kind of corals or fish or anything mm-hmm. like that and he's like the cheat code is the sand and the rock and i know that's something like as an og reefer you know this like you oh, you yeah. understand this already and we go through <laughs> all these beginners you know go through well should i go dry should i go live should i go dry and they go dry because they don't want the pests and then you go through six months of whatever algae pops up and then diatoms and all the things. And I, mm-hmm. I'm i crossing my fingers at this point, but this thing's been up for like two and a half, three months. And I don't, I don't have yeah. any of that. You're so, not going through all these phases. I don't want to say that it's that I'm out of the woods because yeah. there's always the possibility of something popping up here. But I really love that. I finally get to see the Tamini Tang do some work. That dude yeah. is all over the tank. My kids came up the other day. They're like, Dad, one of the fish is kissing the rock all the time. And I was like, no, he's doing his job. Let him go. Yeah. Let him do his thing. Um, you had mentioned uh, the Vibrant booth at Aquashella Daytona. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like that was probably one of the more impressive booths at uh, at the sh- at the show, the Western Australian corals it are was nice. f- just phenomenal. Oh yeah, that's the thing. You can find corals from. I mean, you could be on the same island, but if you're between the north side and the south side, or the east or west, you can find a completely different species growing. And even though the collection site and all it takes is a little stroll up the beach, down to the first the next location or the next reef, and you could find completely different first species. So when it comes to Western Australia, I mean. That booth was gorgeous. That scoli, uh, little button score they had with the pinks and yellows. Man. Yeah. You guys featured it already in your filters. And that thing, <laughs> I even walked over to Kevin. I said, how, how, how much is, you know, how much is that one? Just curious, <laughs> throwing it out there. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah cause I, I could find room. I have room. And, yeah. uh, yeah. It's a button but, score. Uh, it's a little guy. Yeah. It's a, yeah. yeah it's nothing too big. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is I can't hide the, uh, the fact of how much it costs from, <laughs> from stephanie because she was well aware of how much that a lot of it costs yeah well the thing is is like they i think they sold that one i don't know if they sold it at the show or if oh, they really? had a buyer already but uh a lot of those because top shelf is the the retailer that bought all those corals mm-hmm. um, but a lot of those are available on the website and this isn't just a plug but it's like uh you know they're available in while they're not as crazy colored as that particular yeah. one, there's some there's some pretty oh, impressive yeah. buttons in that in that collection. So I really want to go out with uh, I think his name was Brendan, the diver that was there. I really want to take a I trip to him, Western yeah. Australia and go with him and look at all these corals in the wild because I know they don't necessarily look like that in the yeah. wild. Yeah, um, you got to have a good eye. But he also said that you know they're digging these scolies out of like an inch of silt yeah so they're in pretty uh pretty silty water and i believe it of course i would love i mean even when i was talking i said i was saying the exact same thing when i met him i said man it would be great to go on a diving trip because uh, a while back was it like eight nine years ago i made a dive flashlight and i actually replaced all the diodes inside of it and it's been led at first it's like and put in royal blue i put uv i put of course pretty much everything you would take out of a radion and i put it yeah. inside of it and i wanted i just t- cranked it up all the way just so i can see <laughs> if i can find something underwater and find anything fluoresce here and there but oh yeah that would be phenomenal 
Yeah, I wish Australia was a little bit easier to get to. If that was the case, I'd be there way more, right? It's it's definitely oh, yeah. one of those places you can't go less than two weeks without, you know, seeing stuff. So, but yeah, I I think Western Australia is on the on the docket at some point for sure. Um, oh, yeah. Next year yeah. for me is gonna be. Next year will be my FRS. I we're planning on it because her family's in New Zealand. So when we're already in that side of the world. Maybe a little trip to Karen's Marine or maybe mm-hmm. to Western Australia. Who knows? So, yeah. I would, and I also was thinking about signing up for a night dive. I just want to see, of course, all the, the fluorescence from the corals, but also see what else cause it can kind of float on by and see what yeah. I can kind of capture on a film. Got to check those octopus at night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess to wrap up the Red Sea 625, it's. It's doing it's doing its thing. I will say the only the only issue that I'm really running into right now is just some um, some paling colors in the coral. Hmm. But I I would imagine that that's probably coming from just a lack of nutrients in the tank, most um, likely. Which is why I'm trying to to amp it up because even even with par readings, you know I'm looking at like max of. 250 micromoles so it's not even it's not crazy in there Um, i don't have the lights i don't have the lights turned up so nothing's getting nothing's getting burned um yeah so it's not that but i think it's probably more nutrients that would i would definitely go that route and for nutrients wise i've always as far as how you had nutrients as far as nitrates phosphates i mean you get those deep dark richer colors than just don't get me wrong, the pastel used to look, look nice, but at the same time, if I feel like you're teeter-tottering on an edge where you could push yourself over too low of a nutrients, bottom out, and then everything just goes, you know, loses it yeah. at that point. But, oh yeah, add some more nutrients and focus, I would say focus on the nitrates quite a bit. As far as that, can you, the consumption of that is incredible in a lot of tanks. I've dosed nitrates. I still dose nitrate at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, it's so funny, and I keep, I always tell, tell, you know, people that I see at the LFS, this or just, you know, friends on Instagram. It's so crazy that five years ago we want you, everybody wanted zero everything. And now we're all like dosing nitrates and phosphates in our tank because you know, that's the the corals. They need it. They, they need that to, to survive. So they have um, to feed too. Yeah. Yeah. Any tips or tricks from, from the, uh, top shelf aquatics days? Um, that's like Ooh. with making like helping corals with that color because obviously you know top shelf has some of the most colorful corals in the game mm-hmm. can you reveal any of those secrets or are they secrets at all um some are secrets uh some are of uh, course some are procedures and processes that everybody already knows it's just how do you apply it and uh, one of them partially is is just that nutrients keep those nutrients up don't let them bottom out because you want those deep, dark, rich colors, especially the ones you see in photos. Because a lot of times when you see a photo, you think, oh, wow, it must be changed. No, they can become those colors if you have your tank as far as settled in and you have higher nutrients because you will get those deep, dark, rich colors. Uh, feed your corals. Uh, if you have a new tank and you're just starting out, I wouldn't suggest feeding it because you're going to have an overload of nutrients or you may have large swings. So keep it low in the beginning. Once your corals start yeah. filling out, feed them. They're... They would have always feed them. And we put it on as far as a couple of times online, actually several times on adding in Fido Feast, Rodeo Feast, adding a lot of as far as a mixture. Uh, Kevin's gone multiple times saying about Benepets, adding that to the as far as mixture as well and just shake it up and make it into a smoothie. Add it in. Don't do it every day. A couple of times a week is, is more than enough. As long as they get the yeah. extra nutrients, the corals need that, that feeding time. After talking to Taras for quite some time about Fido and all the different, uh, you know, the uh, Fidos that he cultures there now mm-hmm. at the top shelf farm, it just, it makes so much sense to add that in again, going back to kind of what we were talking about before yeah. the podcast started with, uh, you know, Salem and him talking about the natural bacteria that need to be in and present in a reef tank and, you know, removing them through UV and antibiotics and things like that. It's like now, okay, I get that this is a controlled environment. I get that we are trying mm-hmm. to, con- this is not the ocean, right? So this is yeah. going to be a different thing. However, how much of the natural, um, 
how much of that natural digestion can we replicate? And you know, it's out there. The all of those strains of Fido are in the ocean, and if oh, yeah. we can replicate some of that, or at least put that on the on the dinner plate, you know, every everything's going to benefit, right? Yeah, absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. I mean, there are times where I turn my tank into a snow globe, where there's just so much food floating around, and I don't turn the pumps off. They just keep twirling around until something catches it eventually, and it's just a point where. Some people think I'm overdoing it. And then I'll check my nitrates and phosphates and it hasn't budged a bit. And mm-hmm. part of it is that cryptographugium with all those sponges. And I actually don't have filter socks. I don't have a uh, roller mat. Because my cryptographugium, everything, water enters that little re- section. And every sponge tunicate is doing the cleaning for me. So I have no socks to clean. Basically, my socks are living and they clean themselves and they just grow. To the point yeah. where I'll just take a razor blade. If it's growing on the side, I'll scrape them off, toss it out, and they'll regrow, and it'll be a constant cycle. So this is the third or fourth time cryptic refugiums or sumps have come up on this podcast. Explain how you've set yours up. Because in my mind, I, I think of Keith's, I think of Reef Bums, and he's plumbed an entirely separate vessel. It's a 60, mm-hmm. I think it's a 60-gallon black, you know, pvc vessel with a lid on it but it sounds Mm -hmm. like yours is actually just a section in your sump correct yes uh i am a by day i'm an engineer so of course i when i made my sump i used a program called solidworks i designed it specifically to have a light refugium and a cryptic refugium one on each side and the cryptic refugium the way i've done it over the years is i've tried several different methods on what's the best growth for a cryptic refugium And I have even tried, as mentioned earlier, a box completely blacked out, black acrylic top to bottom. And I assumed at first at that point in time that if there was no light, I would get the most amount of growth, the most amount of sponges to kind of come out of there. Unfortunately, I was wrong. That little of far as bulkhead with just drizzles of light, a beam of light shooting in onto the rock, just enough where sponges, tunicates were gathering in that little beam. And it would just explode from there. And then as the further away they got from that little beam of light, the less growth, even though it was still a great cryptic refugium. So now what I do now is my current one is set up to where I have a small slit where the water enters from the light refugium, the macroalgae. And that small slit is more than enough light to illuminate the entire inside because it's all white acrylic. So white reflects the light all throughout the entire cryptic refugium. And I get just enough light where I'll get growth of sponges everywhere on sides on the rock or as you name it and uh it's also home to a little uh marine beta <laughs> who's down there oh really who hangs out yeah he was a <laughs> uh an accidental purchase <laughs> from somebody else and uh, i said i'll take him i'll put him in my sump healthy eats everything in the world never really thought about having a marine beta i love rare fish from ventralis antheas to my golden pair of uh, angels that i adore but uh, yeah, he's down there creating lots of waste, helps out quite a bit, and uh, he loves his cryptic zone. So Take I think we should do all we should do a whole episode on uh, sump fish. Yeah, <laughs> the fish that have been banned to the sump for whatever reason. I feel like most was, of them it's because they're problem children, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he he was a rescue when the the when the local fish stores uh, said no, we don't really need any marine betas at the moment. We we're full, and I'm like, you know what, this guy is uh, he's. He just follows you around the tank. He's by himself. I said, I'll take him in. I have a nice little place for him. The only thing is, I have small fish in the big tank. So I was worried that, like my bongo shrimp at the time, I was worried he was going to nab yeah. him and eat him right up. So he's he's relaxing. So what do you keep in your in the light refugium? So you've got the light refugium in the dark. What do you keep in? Are you keeping macroalgae in there? Oh yes, I am. I am starting to put together a small collection of macroalgae. At the moment, uh, I had shadow for a while, but it kind of mm, it didn't bore me. It was just I've had it for so many time. I wanted to try something different. So at it's the boring. moment, I currently. it is what you know it's a there's so many different (laughs) macroalgae in the world right (laughs) oh god yes and uh yeah as far as i i decided one day i was just crumpled it up and i said hey listen anybody wants a big piece of chato it's all yours so that went out the door and right now i have a lot of dragon's breath because those Mm -hmm. those iridescent tips are just Mm -hmm. stunning especially under the blue light 
Yeah. Now, I wanted to add a little bit something different and to it. So at one show, I found some macroalgae that was being sold as dragon's breath. Usually anything that's red with a little bit of fluorescence is being sold as dragon's breath anywhere because let me people know the names. And I started growing it out. I've been growing this particular macro for years now. And uh, the scientific name escapes me at the moment. I just said it this morning because I gave a piece to Dennis Tigaboy on Instagram. Oh, yeah. And he was he wanted to do I asked him if I wanted to do some trades for different macro algae. He was more than happy to. Uh, it's the same one that Julian Sprung has in his sump. And the one that Colin at Morphomologic had posted on online. He goes, have this macro algae has these little fluorescent dots like a leopard print all throughout the yes. actual macroalgae. I know and, the one you're talking about. Yep. And I can, I just, for this, I knew a few different names. I sent it off to Colin. I said, I think it's this one because everybody online is saying these certain degrees, is, this is what it is. And uh, Kevin at Top Shelf had called me and asked me because he knew that I, I dabble in macroalgae as well. Do you have uh-huh. any? I said, no, not yet. I have a, a piece of this. I teased him for a little bit and I actually had a piece setting aside for him. But I've had it for years. Apparently, it's a pest in the Solomon Islands, and it accidentally got imported as far as a while back. And it's just starting to kind of pop up in certain areas, and I've been growing it forever. And then a few other species I do not know the name of uh, that are, they are traded with, uh, with Dennis at the Reefapalooza Dallas we met up. Yeah. Dennis has quite the extensive collection of macros. I got a chance to visit him. We were in Seattle for a show called the reef works. I'm not sure if they still do that anymore. Um, but I, I got a chance to go out there to Seattle and and speak and then meet Dennis, go to his basement, see all his macro tanks. And it's just, I, to call it a work of art, I feel like is, is an understatement because he really just takes salt water to the next level when it comes to, Oh yeah you know, the visual of it, because we're not seeing fluorescent holy grail torches. We're not mm-hmm. seeing fimbrophilia. You know, we're not seeing these. We're seeing oh, yeah. s- blue sponges and red sponges and gracilaria and chato and all these different macroalgaes set up in different ways. And I think one of my favorites is, uh, I hope I'm getting this name right, Halmidia or Halamida. Uh, it's, it look like little cactuses, right? Mm -hmm. So cool. Like the formation of, of of these algaes is just stunning. So I, I would have, I've had a macro algae tank in the past. I do not have one currently and I miss it because it's like one of the easiest things to take care of because it's like, it's a nutrient control farm, right? Oh yeah. So they're all doing the the dirty work and yeah, you're going to have to be dosing some nitrates and also yeah. like Chato grow and iron and all of those things too. But, um, yeah, that, that, uh, speckled algae that you're talking about kind of making the rounds right now, right? It's like the next hottest macro. <laughs> it is. It is one of the hottest macros out there. I mean, unbelievable, but I actually got a little extremely nerdy when that came out because everybody was calling it by a certain scientific name. And this is probably the nerd in me, but I looked at the name. I knew it was wrong. Looked at the species. I knew it was wrong. So I tracked down the professor who discovered it in the ocean over a decade ago. And I emailed him. I said, hey, is this your macroalgae? Because everybody's calling this. And I called him. I left him an email at the same time. Unfortunately, he didn't get back to me just yet. But uh, I really wanted to know the species just to prove that it was something different. But yeah. it is a gorgeous little species. And uh, Julian, that uh, he already picked out a name, uh, uh, found the scientific name. Is already He's correct. It just that depending on what light you grow it in, it can grow either more condensed or the leaves can be spread out depending on if you give it more blue light or if you give it more white light. Because I've grown it in the mangrove pond too in the sun. See, that's the thing is, is hobbyists have a tendency to ask other hobbyists. And sometimes we just need to ask the scientists, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is what you did. So congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to see a photo of how your sump is set up. I feel like a lot of yeah. people would probably find that very beneficial. How many gallons would you say it is? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if you've got a marine beta in this section of your sump, it's got to be decent size, right? It's a good size. The, the beta isn't that big. He's a small little guy. Um, but I'd say it's... And it's funny as it sounds, the sump I think is bigger than my tank. It's somewhere around 60 some odd gallons, just the sump, 60 to, my, my tank right now is a 60 cube. And of course, plan to be upgrading it to far as down the road, but moving to a different state and setting up shop is a 
you know, make sure the house is right and tanks are right and yeah. the water change yeah. station. Yeah, for as I'll be upgrading soon. But I think it's about somewhere between uh, 60 to 70 gallons of the sump, and then the tank is 60 gallons. Yeah, I feel you on that. Your sump is like a sump, having a sump that's bigger than the actual display. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I just I, I like knowing that. <laughs> It feels good like, to know that you could probably add on another tank at some point, right? <laughs> oh, that that's the whole point. That was my mindset. I'm like, I'm going to get a bigger tank. I'm definitely yeah. going to get a bigger tank. And then that's going to be, <laughs> I'm already set. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some, uh, some of your favorite corals, um, from different regions. Um, maybe you've got some, some selects out there that you like, uh, or, or some, you had suggested maybe doing favorite corals past, present and future what would those be for you wow i have there are numerous corals if i would go to an iconic coral that we don't keep in the hobby but the coral that got me interested in marine biology that got me interested in reefing interested in corals was the elk one coral that was from the in from the caribbean just those i would see those large on tv just magnificent structures that were gosh like 20 feet wide 20 feet high they're just enormous branches and i understand the fluorescence isn't there but when you're a little kid and you're watching watching flipper when it's a little kid and you see those <laughs> corals in the background i was just like taken back i was like what is that what is that growing is it alive is it a plant what is that so that's how that uh kind of a uh, coral love began so always have a, a you know soft spot for that also for like mushrooms, of course, Recordia. Recordia in summer from Florida, you know, having Recordia in my tank has always just been a, just, you know, one of those corals I have a soft spot. St. Thomas I love as well. Uh, yeah. Always, but now I'm more of an acro guy. So I have a lot of my Acropora, Acropora microlides, Acropora forest. I mean, Hyacinthus, I mean, you know, the Hokia. I mean, that would be a nice coral to get next time as far as the hardline Hokie. Uh, yeah. That would be something I'll keep my eyes out for. But I have a lot of the top shelf piece of courses as well. We have the uh, the splice. That one's a beautiful piece. Um, always have a big soft spot for Akans, uh, for as I should say, for as well. Micromusa, the Lords, Lord Hadoensis. Those things are absolutely beautiful. Or Micromusa Akimensis, that one, you know, just a smaller Micromusa. The ones that mm -hmm. original micros from way back when. Yeah. But uh, right now, sticking with a lot of acros. But in the future, hopefully get some NPS. NPS uh for some reason i the blanophilia to dendro very similar just mm -hmm. not as colorful but just something about it it's it's a different it's a singular polyp you never see anything grow out of it and it just you know it's just one of those corals i can see from time to time and just know it's you know something different yeah at first but sometimes you'll have ones that have a little bit of pink and a little bit of orange stripes those are the ones i look out for and these little white mm -hmm. dots from time to time that kind of come out but those are you know absolutely stunning but there's not many corals i do not like but right now hmm acropora of course i do have a big spot bar mainly for you you've probably seen it on the top show website is the rainbow sherbet that hmm. coral is been around before top shelf existed that was in my tank when maricultures first came in and no one thought maricultures would survive everybody just said there it's a horrible idea they always die they discolor they brown so i was determined mm. to keep that one alive i got it on christmas actually and got it probably about six years before top shelf ever opened and i sat there and i said you know what i'm going to keep this alive no matter what so i tested my water water changes everything possible even kept the little banded aqua crab inside and left that little girl in there nice. forever and after a while, it just became a beast. It grew no matter what. A beautiful table. At the time, you couldn't find tables. Everybody wanted to have a table to aquascape with. And that coral right there, which just has a special place because for over two years, I fought to keep that coral alive to the point where when Top Shelf first got their first piece, I was cleaning my tank. And at the time, I called it fragging. <laughs> I knocked a piece about yay big, about as big as this microphone yeah. off. And I gave it to Kevin. I said, hey, listen. Broke it off, keep it. If you want to grow it out, go for it. It's got burgundy polyps, burgundy kind of base a little bit. It's a little pearescence to the front. And it's got a green of ours when it actually starts to encrust. So that coral has a very close part to my heart piece because I spent so much time and effort keeping it alive. 
Yeah. So what was the what was some of your tactics? Because I feel like that mariculture thing still exists. That's that stigma still exists. It's like even even my local fish stores will get in maricultured acro and you're just like you're rolling the dice or that's what it seems like. But if there's a if there's a tactic that you use that we could all learn from, that'd be awesome. When I look for when I'm looking at any kind of maricultures and I want because that's that's some of the exciting part. I I still love it to this day to find a, a mariculture or to find a wild piece, even though as far as, you know, something brand new, you never know what color is it going to be? What shape is it going to be? Is it going to be a, a bushing core where it's just going to bush like so? Or is it going to be plating? How tall is it going to take into a crust? Is it going to be, I mean, there's all these questions that go through your head. And that's the, like the part of I love about finding maricultures. So what I look for is, you know, obviously look for polyp extension. If I'm looking for find a coral that's lighter in color, kind of bleached out, I'm going to put it in slightly lower light just to let it kind of slowly regrow towards the side of the tank. Of course, I'm not necessarily on frag racks, but just kind of side. I don't really put it on the sand, though, because a lot of times sand is where your lowest flow is. And especially mm -hmm. with an acro mariculture, when you're just getting it in, I like to put it under a nice medium flow because they still need that exchange of nutrients. They still need that, you know, that extra flow to bring as far as, you know, carbonates and calcium to a skeleton so it can regrow so it can heal and of course on top of that my nutrients it needs it needs food it doesn't if it's fresh if it's bleached it doesn't have that symbiote and for us you know suicinthelli to help boost it up it's lost it on the way and travel so i will try to get some of those factors to kind of keep it to kind of slowly bring it up and slowly grow it i'll even turn the pumps off and i've even you know pipetted you know coral foods to it just to give it that little extra chance to consume something to regrow its, you know, its tissue. Yeah. I think you, you pointed out something specific that would be good to look out for, especially if it's been, maybe if it's been in the LFS for a little bit of time, say it's mm. been there for a week or two and you've got that polyp extension on there. Mm -hmm. That's, that's probably a good sign that it's adapting to aquarium oh, yeah. life. You know, after being in the ocean, it's a, it's a tough transition I would imagine. And it's going to take mm -hmm. a long time. I mean, how long did that sherbet take, for you to actually for it to start actually growing it was growing uh, i gotta remember this is in the days where like it was it was a while back so there wasn't as much technology or foods or anything that you could possibly find um cellcon was i was dripping cellcon into the water you know all over the place just to for corals for fish for everything that would uptake it and it probably took me about ooh, a little less than a year and then all of a sudden like almost Almost a year on Thanksgiving of the following year. It was when it finally as far as started having these little growth tips. And then it was not just one. It started happening all around the rim because it was a plating. It was just starting to come out. And those little yeah. growth tips popped. And I was ecstatic. And I was just, I mean, I did a water change <laughs> that night because I wanted to see more, more growth. I want to see more polyp extension. But when you first see it like that, it's, you know, that's the parts that I wait for. I know it took me so long to do, but... That effort, it was, it was worth it. Yeah. Now it's everywhere yeah. and every, a lot of people have it. <laughs> it's all over the country. <laughs> but that's cool. I mean, I, I feel like that's, that, uh, that's a really cool thing to, to have is the story attached to the coral. Um, just recently listening to the Reef Bum tribute to Jake and Sanjay had said that he is not interested in scientific names whatsoever. He's like, I could care less. He's like, I have hundreds of stories in my tank. And I relate to that a lot, um, mm. especially with a lot of my, to go to, go to my like past and actually still, I guess, to this pre the present day is my love for sarcophyton and the long yeah. polyp sarcophyton and just leathers in general. And I think Jake was one of those guys that he just kind of turned me on to this, you know, this mm -hmm. brown sarcophyton that waves in the, <laughs> in the, uh, in the flow of the tank. It's just, a, it's such a cool coral. And the thing about it is that I've got a couple, I'm looking at them right now. I've got a couple and one of them in particular, I sent to him and that was our first like interaction through mm -hmm. email going back and forth on just is this or is this not a weeping willow um and uh so now i've got a couple in the collection that kind of are similar to that but i get so many messages about that particular coral you know i've 
you had the dragon souls and the holy grails and all of the you know exciting colorful corals but those are the one the mainstays in this hobby those are the ones that get the most attention you know mm -hmm. from from like a, the real hobbyists that really that reach out and say hey do you have any frags of this uh, the answer is not right now so yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love a good toastal even back in the day when you had massive acro tanks there was always one and usually it was a yellow fiji letter that they would always have one like one the size of a basketball in yep. the middle of their tank and everybody goes what's that i see all these <laughs> sticks especially with people who don't know anything about reef tanks they come over and look at it going what's that it's a toadstool <laughs> a toadstool what is that it's so different from your other court yeah so i i, I get <laughs> yeah. the uh, i get the attraction if you're too bad uh, i didn't get to see you in, in daytona because my first local fish store is actually still in daytona and in oh, one really? of their old red sea tanks i think it's red sea the tank is probably like a decade old and smack center it's like a two foot long toadstool just sitting there uh, for a side to side and there's mm -hmm. two clock guys and uh, for his inhabit it and it's just been there forever <laughs> owner's like yeah Clon just kind of stays there there's no big deal yeah you know <laughs> Clon clonfish love the uh the toadstool uh, polyps that's for sure oh yeah so like for me present corals uh that i'm really kind of liking i don't know i think that since top shelf sent me a bunch of this sps i mean satos has always been one of my favorites but uh i really love this grafted piece that they sent um oh, yeah. but uh, they do have a triple grafted Satosa at top shelf with purple in there too. So it's like an orange, a red, mm -hmm. and a purple. That thing is awesome. Mm -hmm. I remember when that color started popping out of the Satosa and you started seeing a few frags like that. Yeah. And there are a couple, like there are, I'd say about half a dozen lucky people who probably didn't know it at the time. We posted them on the site who started to get the purple and the other colors in them. And we, it was just posted as a regular because at the time it was very faint. And of course, before any corals left the store, it was uh, I always did final inspections. I made sure that you know checked every coral for is anything you know make sure it was top notch. Yeah. And I saw a couple of them like, ooh, that's a nice one. They just got a really good piece. They got <laughs> real lucky because that color is coming out. Yeah. <laughs> don't kill this coral. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to call them up. I don't know. I've always I've I, I I've always loved the uh, Hydnophora as well. The Jason Fox uh, video that Jake did with Jason Fox down in his basement. He had oh, that yeah. just that I forget what he calls it, but it's just the most green Hydnophora you've ever seen in your life. And this thing mm -hmm. was just like cascading off of a rock onto the bare bottom of the tank, and it's just like one of the coolest things. I know they're a little aggressive, or they can be a little aggressive, but it's such a cool coral, you know? Yeah. Mm hmm And you, you start to fall, you start to like fall for certain corals that you've had for a while, or just it doesn't have to be super high end. There'll be corals that just for some reason, like you won't get rid of it. Yeah. I have a Duncan that I have not got rid of because when Julian first wrote the article about Duncans way back when, I saw a Duncan in the store, never saw one before. And I still have it to this day. Yeah. It's the size of a basketball. It's yeah. in Stephanie, it's in Stephanie's tank at the moment because that it's just enormous but i can't get rid of it and i'd have to use like three diamond blades to cut the skeleton that's you know three inches thick yeah julian is uh synonymous with duncan's I, we did that whole video yeah. with uh, carolina aquatics and uh he just went off on duncan's he was one of the first ones i think in the hobby to mm -hmm. to get them in and then to propagate and then you know put it out into the world so it's it, there's a very high probability that the duncan that you have in your tank probably started with that original that Julian got, which I think is pretty cool. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, especially though. Uh, I drove, the, oh, I was, I just, I drove from Orlando to Daytona. I drove an hour and a half because I heard a store had a Duncan Coral. Never seen one in my life yeah. at the time. I was, I called the store, I said, hold it. I get off at work at five o'clock. <laughs> I'll be there at, I'll be there before you close. How much just, did you pay for it? For That's the question. Oh God. Uh, I had a little credit at the store because I was trading some corals. So I only paid at the time. It was, I know it's crazy, like 60, 60 bucks for a single head. Yeah, that so is, that's crazy. For a Duncan, that's, you know. <laughs> and then I, I had, I, so it was probably somewhere like 100 bucks at the time just because I had a little bit extra credit, store credit with it. So, yeah. But no one had seen a Duncan. Then all of a sudden, Duncans are everywhere. So, mm -hmm. but you know, it's still here. 
it's a cool feeding response. It's just a cool. It's mm-hmm. it's it's usually in in the beginner realm. So you're you're probably you know you're if you're starting off in the hobby, you've probably you will probably end up with a Duncan in your tank at some point. And mm-hmm. any of those surviving corals from the very first tank that you have are always going to stick with you. I've got an orange Yuma, and I've had this thing for, I don't know, maybe six or seven years at this point. And again, it's not like the flashiest coral in the world. It's just, it's it's a Yuma. It's a cool looking yeah. shroom, but at the same time, you know, it's it's got a little place in, in my heart, so. <laughs> yeah. God, no. You have me thinking now because I do have a an Acropora in my tank. It's a Bonze style uh, of Lida. And um, that one is, it was from my first ever local fish store. I was probably, I got it in the early 2000s and I've had it ever since. And it's been, I've lost it down to three polyps, three polyps on an Acro. Wow. And I, I said, there's no way I'm losing this because if they lose it, I'll never see it again. And it's just that one that I was saw as a kid in high school. Yeah. And no one had Acropor in the late nineties. I mean, a few people here and there. And they were like the gods of of corals back then. And in Central Florida, when I saw that coral and I saw these branches, I mean, sticking up, I'm like, I have to have a piece. Yeah. How do I grow it? Yeah. What do I do? And I still keep it. Yeah, I think uh, if there's one thing that I've learned from this conversation with you, it is to see potentially a dying coral in your tank and saying, you are not dying. I am going to mm-hmm. make sure you do not die, and I'm going to baby you <laughs> until you come back. I mean, three polyps on an acro is pretty extreme to come back from, so <laughs> kudos to you on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, every, I got some flag for it for a little bit going, you're trying to save that? I, said, I have to. Yeah, I have no choice. Yeah, it's it's been with me. I love that, and we we've talked with uh, Sarah Stevens talked about. I think she might have talked about this in the ladies only podcast that we just put up um, about how they were triaging corals with aminos and doing amino baths in Florida uh, mm. for the reef track. And I think that that might be something that we could adopt at some point in the hobby if that's not already starting to happen. But just giving fifteen minute heavy amino baths on ailing corals so that we can, you know, kind of triage them, give them those aminos that they oh, need. Yeah. But, uh, she used acro power from Julian and oh, yeah, Julian was so. telling the story about how she randomly called up one day and was like, I need a five gallon bucket of acro power stat. <laughs> it's like, that's a lot of aminos. <laughs> sure. I have one laying around here somewhere. I yeah. Mean. But, it, but even Julian was talking about how, he was surprised and he's he's you know one of the godfathers of this hobby and if he's surprised you know that that's that's something that's a little bit more cutting edge so i don't know i think that that's cool and oh, uh i will adopt absolutely no no death in my tank from now on if i see something going on i'm i'm saying you're living you're living I'm get you through this <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I love that mentality. So what's a, what's a coral that, uh, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success. You've been in the hobby for a long time. So do you have a nemesis coral? Do you have one of those corals that you just, uh, you fight with every single time? <laughs> I had, used to have a bad nemesis. I used to, Xenia used to be my nemesis when I first started out. Not because it overgrowed, just because it melted. As far as I would have all these other corals in my tank. I even had one, uh, you know, this is like late 90s. And it was a nano tank, and I was sitting there, and I had this little green slimer was growing. I'm like, oh, look, I have Acropora. It's growing. Look at this. I have Xenia. It's not growing. Mm-hmm. And that was my original nemesis. But now moving forward, I am looking more towards uh, some NPS because I would love to get back into NPS. And because and, that is a whole other realm of feeding, keeping corals alive. And it's just that's something as far as that was – soon to be my nemesis <laughs> because I know there's a lot of challenges associated with keeping constant feeding, keeping the water clean. That's going to be, that's going to be my next one. Yeah. Uh, there's a, what, what aquarium is it? That's a public aquarium and they have a giant MPS display tank and it's just sun oh. corals and yeah. non photosynthetic, uh, gorgs and things like that. It's just really, they have some, I forget where yeah, it is. Yeah, there's some blotchy antsies, I think. I've seen the I've seen an article about it. I can't remember which aquarium it is. Uh, we just did, uh, Levi just did an article on the um, uh, chromonepthia. It's, um, yeah. 
really colorful uh, MPS. I forgot the name of these. It, carnation coral. Carnation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The carnation. Or as, and as crazy as it sounds, every time I've talked to a uh, anybody who's gone over to Indo for us and they've actually seen them in the wild, they're, you know, I've talked to a couple of divers and they were like, they were everywhere, a couple of collectors uh, back in the day. And they said, they're just growing. They're literally just thousands on a, on a ridge and you'll just see them just swaying back and forth. And those ones are, I mean, those are gorgeous. Yeah. But there used to be somebody on Nano Reef who used to keep them. I don't remember. He had an article. I'm not sure it was Reef Builders. Um, it was a while back. And he kept it. And he had the tank feeding. His name was Uriu. U-R-U-U, I believe. This was his screen name. Mm -hmm. And he had, uh, I believe, a couple of rhizos in there. Just very large dendros in so many words. And between that, sea fans, he had all those things in the tank. And those things were absolutely stunning. The carnations. And if you're lucky you'll find a carnation crab. It looks identical to the polyps on our carnation coral. That's cool. Matches the little flakes, matches the red, the oranges. It's, uh, that would be you know, the cherry on top. Yeah, I remember Jake had the, uh, Christ the Christmas tree worm tank, which is still there. And I remember he had a ah. bunch of MPS in there and he would just feed the crap out of that tank yeah. you know, on the daily. And then all the, you know, all the excess would flow into one of the coral flats and then f kind of mm -hmm. feed the broadcast, feed everything else. But yeah, you got to stay up on that. And I, I think there's still so much that we don't know about MPS. You know, on the other side of like your typical sun corals and, you know, dendros and things like that, that we see a lot of in the hobby, but like the carnation mm -hmm. corals and things like that, the NPS uh, gorgs, you know, there's still so much to learn. And I think it, I always say this, but I think that that's one thing that I love about this hobby so much is even though we've got people like you in the hobby that know so much, there's still so much left to be learned. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's what I love about it. there's always something more to learn and there's something new. There's something, something to discover. And it could be just something that comes on a Mary culture rock that's at the bottom of a base and it just slightly poking off. And then you want to grab it, grow it and see what it turns into be. Yeah. That's the... That's the exciting part for me. I love that part. Yeah. If I had a nemesis, I would say it's actually Micro Musa, Mi Micro Musa right now. Uh, the Lords, formerly known as, the artist formerly known as Acans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so many different color you varieties. Searches. Yeah, there's so many different color varieties of those guys too, the rainbows. And they're also, uh, I think my favorites are probably those pink pastel -y ones. Um, not so much yeah. the bright orange and the bright blues and reds, but like the pastel mm -hmm. pinks and the, I just, the pastel blues. I just love those corals so much, but for me, they've always done it. I haven't tried them in a while because it's one of those things where I'm a little nervous about it. I'm a little nervous getting back into it, but, uh, they might do well at this point. I don't know, but you know, you get one of those rainbows and they just turn, they go revert back to orange. <laughs> mm -hmm. They get, they get huge, orange and red. Huge polyps, right? Huge fluffy polyps, but they just go back to orange. <laughs> and then one like day. You get so excited. Yeah, then one day they just get some sort of infection or something and, you know, start to deteriorate. And I don't, I can never explain it. And that's kind of scared me over the years getting back into mm -hmm. them. So that's, I Dude. would say that's my nemesis right now. Do you feed them at all? Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would target feed. Um, uh, that's a great way to get nice, super healthy, fluffy polyps so for us is on like any kind of a forest micro. Just constantly feed. They love to eat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for those, I mean, I, I would do usually do just you know, so I feed frozen frequently for the fish. So mm. I would just take a little bit of yeah. mysis and you know pop it right in each one of those mouths and yeah perfect feeding response is good so um but yeah that and and uh acros i think are are still are still a little one of they're they're one of those corals that uh, intimidates me i guess i should say and i've had them before mm -hmm. i had a disney for a long time and loved that coral so much because it was fun it grew well it's i, th I think out of all the acros I had, it was probably one of the easier ones, the more hardy ones. Um, but I don't, I don't think I ever really had a tank that didn't have like a frag rack. You know, I, I, acros do so much better when they're hanging off the side of a rock or, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I would actually, I built little PVC um, risers and I would stick the acros yeah. on the end and just to get them up in the flow. 
-hmm. and that seemed to work really well too. So that's really good. Yeah. But now that I've got this tank, I've been, I've been like gluing them on the side of everything. And uh, while I don't have any, well, I've got a, I guess I have a couple acros in there right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've just kind of like glued them to the side and hopefully we'll see what they do here in the next you, you, you have the knowledge. I've watched the Bahama Lama videos to the reef, to the transition to reef builders and everything you've done in between. As far as you, I think you have the knowledge as far as just take that first step and as far as add more acros <laughs> or I, I should say second step because you have a couple now and because one, it becomes a slight, it becomes an addiction. As far as you start getting more, just like you do with any LPS, NPS, because they do have that stigma of acros are the hardest things in the world to keep. Well, as far as it's, it's nothing like anything else. Of course, you have a little dirtier water with some LPS. Okay, now we have some macros. Let's clean it up a little bit. You know, yeah. let's maintain our alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. As far as a little bit more as well. Yeah. And you know, it's it's not that, not too bad. And you you actually got it right. Add more flow to it, and you start putting them in up into the flow and now they're growing as far as and they're you know sustaining themselves better sure as far as you have i shouldn't see any problems with it at all okay i'll uh, email you with problems <laughs> when i get them <laughs> what's uh I, i'm just out of out of curiosity and from for my own like personal uh adventure here what are you dosing in your tanks what, what's your dosing regimen looks like look like my dosing uh i now and continue to dose Kalkwasser. Kalkwasser is my number one additive. Uh, I've been using it for 20 years now, uh, I could think of, to the point where, uh, yes, I do have a Kalkwasser reactor. And so because I've been hobby long enough, I said I deserve one. So I bought myself <laughs> a nice geo reactor. Because prior to that, um, uh, even in the college days, my way of dosing Kalkwasser was a Taco Bell cup. In the morning, I wake up. I'd fill a Taco Bell cup, a large, <laughs> fully saturated. I take an airline tube, I tie a little knot in it, come down to the bottom of the sump, and let it drip. When we went to class, by the time I got to class, it was already dripped out. Good to go. That is gonna be the first one. And then at the end, before bed, I would fill another Taco Bell cup, up, full of Kalkwasser, fully saturated, and let that drip during the night wow. while I was gone. So. <laughs> When you don't, when you don't have the funds for the nice, fun equipment. You make your own equipment. Yeah. And I was joking around that with uh, the farm manager at Top Shelf when I was there, and he, I, I told him, Taco Bell cup, twice a day. What about you? He goes, uh, he goes, oh, green tea, Arizona, one bottle. He yeah. was like, we know exactly what it is. <laughs> at least you know that you're not going to overdose. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only so much we can put in this tank. <laughs> so there is also no excuses for not dosing Kalkwasser in your in your tank. I actually just, there's a, we did a little reefers code here in St. Louis. Actually, today this happened. But uh, uh, we've got a couple good groups here on Facebook, and I just popped on, and I was like, hey, anybody have any calc stirs uh, laying around that they'd want to mm -hmm. sell? And a guy reached out and he said, Hey, I've got one. I'm not using it. You can just have it. So it's in a vast Marine, uh, Calcster. It's a really nice one. Um, it needs a new motor, which is fine. You know, 25 bucks off of their website and I'll take a $25 calc reactor. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about that being kind of the main, the main, th uh, dosing that I've done. Cause I've done two part in the past, you know, add the magnesium, all the things. And it, I, I could see myself getting into some trace uh, trace elements down the road, yeah. but I think having that that calcwasser is uh, is that is should be a mainstay in most people's tanks. Um, I don't know if did you ever see that Chummingham's yeah. Reef episode that I did with him up in Chicago? He's got this 450 gallon tank and it's just it filled with acros and just filled with and the only thing he does oh, sure is, is calc. That's it. Oh yeah, yeah. And that was part of the reason why I started dosing it a while back because there was an old store that closed down in, in Florida and they had the tank running for 30 years or so. And there was only two corals in the tank. There was Blue Ridge coral. And a toadstool. If you remember Blue Ridge. And no, it was a softy though. <laughs> okay. It was a, it was a encrusting zinnia oh. from the Caribbean. Okay. And basically it was, they met in the middle 
and they just fought the entire time. They just kept growing upwards. And all that a guy does was just Kalkwasser. He goes, I haven't done a water change in over a decade. Wow. I just dope Kalkwasser, add some top off, and that is it. And But the thing that got me the most was in the center, right between the corals met, one, it was about six inches, extremely old Crocea clam. Stunning colors. The yeah. greens, the turquoise that were on the mantle were just gorgeous. And I said, what do you feed? And I'm like, oh, I just Kalkwasser. And he brought this old book out from his like his office. And he goes, look at this. It was all in German. Kalkwasser. Yeah. Opens it up. This is what I dose right here because this guy doses it. I have no idea who it was or the book. I couldn't read German. So apparently he could. And I just followed it ever since. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's going to be my main, my main dosing here. Once I get that, that all set up. Cause you know, you get the pH boost on that too. And you know, that's, it's nice. Oh yeah. So, oh, I love uh, it. well, as I mean, if, the, if we're, we're up over an hour at this point, again, I say this to everybody, I feel like we could probably go on for, for even longer and just talk corals. You finally have a day off tomorrow, which is fantastic. So yeah, oh, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm sleeping in. Otherwise, I'm going to do, I'm going to work on my tank a little bit. I have water changes set up. I got water already set aside to mix. So uh, I'm excited. I'm nice. going to sit back, relax a little bit and enjoy my final day. Cause uh, as of right now, I'm a sales engineer. So I'm constantly traveling throughout the entire state of Texas, meeting large facilities, manufacturers, design and so forth. And so I do design and I do engineering sales at the same time. So it's a a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, is there, is there anything else you want to talk about before we before we head out tonight? Uh, I could go on for hours. I mean, there's not a topic <laughs> I for us, I don't stop talking about when it comes to reefing or anything. But uh, no, uh, for us, I'm uh, happy to save it for another time. That's no problem. For sure, we'd love to have you back. That's that's for that's for sure. Well, I want to thank you for joining us on the Reef Therapy Podcast. If you've got any questions for David or myself please post them in the comment section below. I want to thank ICP Analysis for being an awesome sponsor. More at icpanalysis.com, and we will see you in the next one. See ya.